There are a handful of commonly asked questions when people start inquiring about regenerative agriculture. I'm Alan Williams. I was born and raised on my family's farm in South Carolina, and I actually represent the sixth generation. They've been there since 1840. Went to Clemson University, graduated there, and uh, then went on to LSU to get a PhD in genetics and reproductive physiology. And quite inadvertently, totally unintended, I ended up spending 15 years in academia. Since I left the university, we have been involved full-time in regenerative ranching and farming in Mississippi and Alabama. And we have been consulting with farmers and ranchers, food companies, branded programs, processors, you name it. Most producers are very concerned that if they make a transition to regenerative agriculture that they're gonna spend the first three or four years losing money. And it's gonna take a while before they can start generating a positive cash flow again. What we typically find is that even in year one, in this transition, that they actually realize a better net margin than they had been realizing prior, the year, even the year prior. They're able to effectively reduce their input cost. And initially, that has the most profound and positive impact on their net margins. If I can reduce my input cost on the things required to raise my livestock or any crop that I may be raising, then even still participating in a commodity market, that allows me, even though I may be getting the same price that I got last year and the year before, I now have less cost in that product. So I'm able to realize more total net margin. The other thing that we often see, many producers are what I call very heavy on equipment. They have way too much equipment. And when they get into regenerative agriculture, they find that they no longer have a need for so much equipment. They can actually do a great job with far less. And so they're able to sell a lot of that equipment. That gets rid of a lot of the maintenance requirements, the depreciation, the repair costs, the labor costs, all of those other things that are associated, even insurance and taxes on that equipment. So they're able to reduce those costs as well. The productivity of their soils and what they're growing in those soils goes way up. Uh, as an example, if you're a rancher, for instance, what we see is that as you build the biology in the soils, you get better nutrient and water cycling, you, those soils become more and more aggregated due to the biological activity and the biotic glues being produced. Then our water infiltration rates go up, the water holding capacity goes up, and whether they're experiencing ex excessive rainfall or drought conditions, they retain a lot more moisture. So they're able to grow more forage for an extended period of the year. And not only are they able to grow more forage through an extended period of year, longer in the year, but they're growing more total forage biomass every week, every month. And when you add all of that up, that enhances their carrying capacity. So now they're able to actually add more animals, more productivity to the exact same acres. And when you do that, you're lowering your total unit cost of production quite effectively. So when we start adding all of these benefits up, then we get, it's like accrued interest at the bank. We, we start to see a lot of accrued benefits and they continue to add up over time. And so what we typically notice is that not only can your net margins improve in year one, but you continue to get incremental improvement in those net margins as you go through the subsequent years. Our immediate answer, with a caveat, is that nothing. You just have to learn to use everything more judiciously and gradually reduce, if, if it's a tool or an input, 
that potentially is harmful to biology and the ecosystem, then eventually you want to learn how to eliminate it from the system. But initially what you can do is we can just start gradually reducing tillage, reducing chemical use, reducing synthetic fertilizer, those types of things. So they're, they're very happy to hear that they don't have to make this hard transition and that all the tools in their toolbox all of a sudden have to be thrown away and are no longer available. Rather, again, all of the tools are still available. It's just using them in a much wiser manner. The definitive answer to that is absolutely it does. Um, however, what we tell them is that even if you don't participate in any kind of alternative or enhanced market opportunities, just simply switching to, to regenerative agriculture will allow you to make more net margin even still participating in the commodity markets. So that gives them a lot of comfort because the commodity market is always everybody's fallback. It, it's what they know is always there. I can always depend on it being there. But then when they know that, okay, I can make more net margin, even if I'm still selling into the same markets I've been selling into, now their comfort level is such that they're more willing to participate in some alternative markets. And make no mistake about it, there are very fast growing and emerging alternative markets. And there are a number of major food companies now who are making a strong move in this direction and will be paying producers premiums for being able to supply them with regeneratively produced products. A very quick answer to that is no, you do not. Certifications are absolutely your choice and are not required at all. And as a matter of fact, many of the, uh, of the companies and branded food programs and others that are buying regeneratively produced products today are not requiring uh, third-party certification. They're just simply verifying themselves that the farmer is following regenerative practices. And the answer to that is absolutely. As a matter of fact, it positions you quite well to participate in those markets. And when that value is fully realized, those that have transitioned early to regenerative agriculture are going to be the biggest benefactors of those programs.